Welcome everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and this is Sunday, May the 2nd. And we're here to talk about God's Word in a way that will be beneficial to us and hopefully edifying in a way that keeps us closer and grounded to God, as that is our goal. The Christian life is to be faithful to God in everything that He has for us and to do His will. That's the most important part about being a, a child of God and serving Him in that way. We're going to look at the lesson today, what direction are you looking? And this is a really kind of a, a thinking about how we look at things and our attitude and our perspective and actually direction that we go to for guidance and strength and everything that really is talking about in that way. We use that word look and looking in different ways. As we think about Matthew chapter 11, verse three, what the scriptures, how it uses this word, the Bible says in verse 3, when John the Baptist was looking for the fact that Jesus was he the Messiah or was he not, are we to look for another? Notice what the text says in verse 3. And he said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? As we know, the Jews were looking for their Messiah, the promised one. Deuteronomy 18 talks about where Moses said that there'd be one that would rise up after him like there is our own brethren. And one of their own would be the one who was the coming Messiah. And John the Baptist, because he was in prison at this time, was not really sure whether Jesus was. Actually, Jesus pointed to his miracles, what he was doing, and everything, the fulfillment of what the Messiah would do. So he basically answers that question by his works and what he's doing to, to be that Messiah they were looking for. And so they were looking for an expectation. That's how it's used in that sense. And in Matthew 12, verse 2, here is where the disciples have ate with these ate corn with unwashed hands, and they've ate their food. And the Bible says in verse 2, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your, your disciples are doing what is lawful to do on the Sabbath. They'd simply take the grain and were eating as they were passing by the grain fields. And so they were accusing him, they were trying to call attention. There's many times the Bible uses the word behold and look. It depends on what translation you're using of the scriptures. And there's times when we'll use the word look to call attention to a certain action that's being done. And that's what it's here, whether right or wrong. And really the Pharisees thought it was wrong for the disciples to do this. But Jesus says, no, they're not breaking the Sabbath in what they were doing. We also think about Acts chapter 3 as this idea of look uh, here is talking about a way of getting someone's attention. Notice in chapter three about the man who was born lame. He was sitting at the, at the gate, beautiful, as Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. And the Bible says in verse three, when he saw Peter, this man, this beggar, saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And that's exactly what Peter was trying to do, get his full attention. And because he had something important to say, it's, that's what we always try to do. We try to beck him with our hands. And that's another way of getting attention. Oftentimes you read in the book of Acts where Paul does this particular thing. He tries to get the attention of his fellow Jews in that way. But notice what it says here, the next part, verse 5. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the, the, the Nazarene walk. And so he heals that man. He actually gave him more than what he'd asked because he gave him the ability to walk and no longer had to beg and be there just simply laying at the gate trying to receive alms from others. And so this idea of looking is important. And I want to look at maybe this idea of where we're looking at. Actually, physically, the direction can be very well what is talked about. We'll talk about this lesson. As we know, some will look downward. And we often will say the idea of someone who's thinking about only this earth life. As we think about heaven and the beautiful place that God has prepared for us, we often think about that is a place that's above, that's not here on the earth, that we are, are below the heaven that God has prepared. As the Bible tells us that the earth is God's footstool. And so we think about that in that way. 
And the attitude of people today is that I'm simply living for what I can get out of this life. I like what Solomon said about things done under the sun. Uh, this earth life that you and I receive every day, we're part of every day. As we're living in this world, we're trying to do what we can. Second so chapter 4, verse 18. Paul mentions the fact, though, that there's a difference between earth life and living with heaven in view. When he said in verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that means a lot to us because we believe the things that we can't see now, presently, like heaven and hell and God, Jesus, the devil, angels, those things are the eternal. The mode of God is an eternal mode. And that heaven, once we get there, is a place that is never ending. And we really can't fathom that because all we see around us is going to disappear one day. It's not going to be here like it presently is. And that's why sometimes people think, well, I'm living for the here and now. I want to simply get what I can out of life. And I'm living for my best life now is what they will basically say. But that's not what God wants. God wants us to have more than simply that. But that's what some people live for. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, take your Bible and turn over there. Here Paul would speak about the gospel and how we believe in a resurrection. And that really necessitates, it actually is necessary for us to believe in an afterlife and that there's more to life than just what we have presently in this body that we live in today. In verse 16, he's talking about the resurrection and proof that Jesus has risen and you and I will also experience this afterlife and, and more than simply the earth life today. In verse 16, the Bible says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And he's basically telling us the gospel is for nothing if we do not rise. If there's no resurrection, then if we're simply living for Christ now, and that's it. That's basically what he's saying is, is the fact that there's more to this. And I believe it, it screams out to us. It's rhetorical, the fact that there is more than simply this life. And we understand there's eternity that is in the balance. And he talks about it in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you're still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And that's talking about the fact that if you die, and that's, that's the end of you, if that's the case, we know that's not the case. And in verse 19, if, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But that's the point, isn't it? The fact that if we have only hope of Christ now while we're living and there's no afterlife, then that is a terrible situation. We're to be pitied in that way. But notice verse 20. Here he answers this by saying, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And that's why the resurrection is the center of everything that we believe and teach is because it's, it says there's more than simply looking down at earth life and saying, well, this is, this is all that there is. Paul would even go on to say and make this point very clearly about why he's preaching, why he's teaching the gospel and risking his life to do so. In verse 30, he says, we are also in danger every hour. I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And so that's a great point, isn't it? The fact that why am I risking my life? Why am I at, at odds with these wild beasts and fighting them? And, and if he's talking about literal beasts, then he is putting himself in jeopardy. And he's talking about things that happens and on a daily basis. You know, he is risking his life for nothing if there is no resurrection. There's nothing more than this life. Then we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because that's it. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying there's more to life. That's what the resurrection chapter, first 
1 Corinthians 15 is called the great resurrection chapter because it deals so much with the resurrection and, and what that means to us. And, and I think it's the greatest chapter on that because it explains that greater than we ever have in other details. You know, we have all the details we'd like to know in some respects because of what Paul wrote there. But we also think about this in another way, another perspective of looking down. Can be an attitude of despair when someone's looking down, like the picture of the man here, maybe is thinking, well, this is a hopeless situation, pessimistic. And we often call someone who's always looking at the dark side of things as being pessimistic. And there's gloomy, looking down always. Well, that's a terrible way to live your life, isn't it? It's not the way God wants us to live. I know there's sometimes that life brings us down. We often talk about down days we have, and we'll have those days. But that should not defeat us. And that's really the hope of the gospel, is that we can have hope and joy that the world can't take away, that circumstances, that loss can't take away from us because there's better days ahead of us. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, we see here where Cain, he was rejected by God because he did not do the offering the way God said to do. And so that's why he was rejected. And then the Bible says his countenance fell. Now, once he was down because of it, he actually got angry because God had rejected him. And he tells him that sin lies at the door if you keep on this attitude of, of being angry because of this. And so that shows us how we can be down sometimes because of the things that we do. In Nehemiah chapter 2, it, here it was with Nehemiah that the city of Jerusalem, the walls were destroyed. He found out that all this was taking place, and he was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes. And there he was sad, and, and here Artaxerxes was wondering why this was. You're not sick, Nehemiah. And so he tells him because the walls, city walls were destroyed, and the place of his father's was in disrepair. That caused him to be greatly sad because of that. And that was a good thing that because it caused him to go and want to rise up and build the walls of Jerusalem. That led him to go out. Artaxerxes let him go and take those to prepare the walls and such. And then we come to the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is a very interesting book because it shows us the tragedy of loss, how Naomi lost her two sons and her husband, but also Ruth, the great hero heroine of the story, where she stays with Naomi and she's bound with her, and they go back to Jerusalem. They go back to the place of the Israelites after being in, in Moab for a while. And we understand Ruth was a Moabitess. Well, she was from the land of Moab, in other words. And the Bible says she came with Naomi, and here they're telling, they see Naomi, these other Israelites. They see her and they say, well, you're back, Naomi. And here is the time when the famine's over, but she had experienced so much loss in during that time. But the Bible says in verse 21, I believe it is, says, but she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has, has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? And you, know, you read that story in the book of Ruth. She, after a while, realizes God is at work. And Ruth eventually gets a husband by her kinsman, Boaz. And all of that, she, Naomi starts to see God at work. And in some ways, she, her faith in God is restored because of all of her great loss. And she changes her attitude in some respects. At the end of the book of Ruth, you see more of a happy ending as God is one who gives us, makes us full again, gives us joy and the things that we can have, experiences of life. But even beyond this life, you know, even if we have all kinds of heartache and pain and suffering in this life that we may from time to time receive, there are better days coming. And that's really what the hope of the gospel gives us so much hope to know that heaven is a place of no tears and that we don't have to be downward all the time. And, and the uh, problems of life will all be a memory when we get to heaven. That's one of the good things about the gospel, isn't it? 
So we need to have that in our lives. In Psalm 42, again, David would talk about these kind of things and how this was kind of suffering that would happen to him. At the beginning of this, very familiar verse, verse 1, says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And here, that's, that's a wonderful thought, that we are, are longing for God so much like that deer wants the water at the water brooks, and it's panting for it. And that's exactly what here the psalmist is saying here. And in verse 3, nearest the tears that happen. So verse 3 says, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember and pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God, while the voice of joy and thanksgiving and multitude keeping festival. So there's a lot of things he used to take great joy in. Now he's down because of things happening in his life, such things as suffering that happens to him. Notice verse 5, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh, my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you in the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon and the mountain of Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. And the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be, will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. He's remembering the good times and the things that God would do and blessings. He's wanting that again. And that's what we all should long for, is that time of rejoicing that we can have that doesn't end because of what we have now. That's why we understand this world is not our home, that we want something beyond this veil of tears, things that happen to us from time to time. Now, some look upward, and there are some that you might think are more joyful, more have a positive attitude, or what we call an optimist. And they have this kind of, of go-lucky attitude. And then we sometimes can envy those people because they have so much joy. You know, Christians should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth. I know the world tries to steal our joy because of uh, the devil tries to through suffering and trials that come our way. But the Bible still tells us to, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul would write, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And that tells us that a man can rejoice even while he's in prison. You think about where Paul wrote that. He was in the prison. He was in chains, in the dungeon, if you might say. He was placed there where he was not free, but yet he's still rejoicing. And that's really what we understand. It's not the outward circumstance always that tears down our joy, but we understand God has better things for us in the gospel of Christ. But then there's also the spiritual side of this, that some look upward for direction and even salvation. So we think about looking up to heaven. And you, know, you might think, well, when everything else fails, Let's give God a try. Well, he needs to be our first try, doesn't he? And our, not our last resort, but the first place we go to is to go to God and help. Times that we need help, we need to go to him. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, here the Bible says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so deep easily ensnares us. And let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's the part about looking, isn't it? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's exactly what we have to We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. As the Bible tells us in the next verse, he kept his eyes on the joy and beyond the cross. And that's what we have to do ourselves. We have to look beyond the suffering of this life. And know that better days are coming, as I've said. And we understand the Bible tells us we keep our eyes on Jesus. We're keeping our eyes on the goal of trying to go to heaven. And that's an upward call. As Paul would tell us, that's exactly what we need to have, an upward call that brings us where we need to be. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, the Bible would speak of here 
about how we need to seek the things that are above. As we look upward, we need to have that attitude of what spiritual blessings, what spiritual work we can do here on the earth. Even though we may be here down on the earth, we're still looked upward in our service to God. In verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And I want to emphasize that because in the last one, last one we looked at, someone looking down all the time, maybe they're not thinking about their spiritual duties, not thinking about the things above and what the kingdom of God requires today, the service and the work, and all we can do to build up the kingdom of God and to help others to look up themselves, to look upward, as the Bible directs us to do. Verse 3 tells us, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, that that old man is crucified, in other words. That's really what verse 1, I believe, is talking about. You raised up with Christ, raised to walk in a newness of life. How do you come out of the waters of baptism there? And the Bible goes on to say, for verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also be revealed with him in glory. And that speaks to us about where our life is. Is your life in Christ hidden in God? And it needs to be if it's not, because that's what it means to have the direction. Even though we may look down at the book, and we may say, well, I'm looking at the page of the book. I'm having to look down like I am right now. But actually, we're looking upward in our walk of faith by looking at the scriptures to know that the word of God helps us to, to be spiritually minded and to walk the way we need to walk every day. In Luke chapter 21, verse 28, there's an interesting statement that Jesus says. He says, now when these things begin to happen, look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And there's a lot that's talked about in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, for that matter, that talks about the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD and how the 70 AD the Romans came in and destroyed uh, the city of Jerusalem because of the Jews' unfaithfulness, because it was the punishment that God required of the Jews, the people who had rejected him. But yet there's a lot that we can learn even today from those things, being prepared, the idea of being prepared, readiness, all that is something we can learn as well. I believe there are some things that the Lord wants us to know about that. But here, he, I believe he's physically, maybe physically talking about lifting up their heads, or maybe it's talking about it in a spiritual way. Think about, well, lift up your heads and realize that there's more than simply this earth life that you're really concerned about. And I think that's what he's talking about there in some respects, maybe. But then think about when Jesus comes. Have you ever thought about that, how that we will see him come, that final time that he comes? Now, I think he was there in some respects when the Bible says over the destruction of Jerusalem. I believe that he oversaw that. And we may not saw him with our naked eyes. Then some may have uh, seen at least what happened there as, as that fulfillment uh, God would say about the destruction of Jerusalem. But yet we look for a time when Jesus is coming again. Maybe you've looked up. You've heard a noise and you heard something really loud like a train. I was When I was young, I would hear something like that. And I'd say, oh, no, that's the Lord coming. Or that might be the trumpet sound. Hear the sound of the horn of that train. And it, it can be really funny. We lived close to a train when I was growing up. And that was one of the things you heard quite often was the sound of the train coming in and such. And you may think, well, that's the, the coming of the Lord when you were little like me. Or maybe even today you hear things like that. So could Jesus come today? And if he did come today, you know, we would be looking up physically. We would be trying to see the Lord. We would see Jesus and all the angels, the archangel Michael, the archangel and the one blowing the trumpet and everything that would happen there on that day, we would see just like the book of Acts says it was un will unfold in that way. In Acts chapter 1, we see the story actually when Jesus goes back to the Father. The context there is he's going back to the Father, and he simply goes up. He ascends into the heavens. The Bible tells verse 9, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on him. 
and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, they were simply looking up and saying, well, we'll see Jesus go up. And they were watching him every moment as he, as he was rising up. The Bible says that a cloud received him out of their sight. Like you have a balloon sometimes, these helium balloons, you'll let it go. And after a while, you'll no longer see it. That's the way Jesus went up. He simply did just like that. It went up higher and higher until they no longer saw him. The clouds overtook him in that way. Well, they actually shielded their eyes from him. And so the Bible goes on to say, just like that, the Bible goes on to say, let's look at verse 10. It says, and as they were gazing intently in the sky while they were going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And so that's what the angels announced. The same way, physically, going up into the sky like he did, he's going to come back physically, and he's going to be in the sky, and we'll go up to him. As the Bible says, and the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, and this is curious because some teach that Jesus is going to come down and set up a kingdom here on this earth. Well, the Bible tells us we're going to him. He's not coming down to us all the way to the earth. But the Bible tells us when Jesus comes, he's going to destroy the earth. And that's one of the purposes of Jesus is to, is to destroy the earth. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible tells us there, these last couple of verses in 1 Thessalonians. Here we learn the, one of these things we often will say in funerals is that here there's a time when Jesus is coming and we be ready for that time. And we need to be comforted with the words that God tells us. Verse 16 beginning says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we are who are alive and remain, we called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall always, shall we, we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that tells us great comfort to know that once we get up in the clouds with Jesus, we're not coming back to this earth. We're going to be here and be exactly where we need to be with God up in heaven, where that place is. So we look upward in that respect. Then there's some who look inward. You may think, well, they look to themselves. They are looking at only at themselves, and that's, that's as far as they go. It's an attitude of self-reliance that says, well, I'm all there is, and, and you can't trust anybody but yourself. That's sad that many people live by that philosophy, and it's sad that they will not trust anyone else, will not be able to, to actually do anything with anyone because of that. And so they're, uh, utter, they're afraid to, to really step out in faith and to do what needs to be done in, in being a help to others. I want to read a poem by William Ernest Henley's poem, Invictus. And this is a, 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 really a poem that talks about this very thing. It's out of the night and the black is, I can't read all, I'm going to drop down a little bit. I let myself be in the way here. But it says, in the clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgings of chance, my head Head is bloody but unbound. In other words, he's saying everything that's happened to me, it's, it's happened for a reason. And, and, and it's, it's only because me, I've done everything. First, the next part says, beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. And that's the poem that really says, you're all that you can trust and that everything revolves around you. And, and it, those that says here, no matter how straight the gate, I think about Matthew 7 every time I think about that and how charged the punishments, the scroll, I believe he's talking about the Bible, if you will, about how if you don't live for Jesus, that there would be punishments because of that. But yet even still, out of all he's suffering, I believe he's facing death even. He says, I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. It's like that song, I did it my way. Many people live that way. They're going to live their way, not God's way. 
we have to be very careful how we live our lives and not just simply be living for ourselves or by ourselves because no man is an island. All of us need each other in some respects. I believe that's a stark contrast to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Here the Bible says about Jesus, and he died for all that those who should live, live should know, uh, who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. In other words, we need to live for others, not just ourselves. Jesus died so we can live and that we can live to help others and serve. Matthew, or actually Mark chapter 10, verse 45 tells us that Jesus gave his life a ransom. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life a ransom for others. And so he did that because he wanted to save you and I from our sins. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 7 talks about the, the trust that we can have with God and in serving him. I believe that's one of the, the Proverbs that we need to take to heart more than any other. We think about some that are very helpful in life, but here is about trust and trusting in God, not trusting in self. Here in verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. And that's good advice for us, that we need to not simply look and say, well, I, I can fix this myself. There are problems that are too big for you to fix by yourself, and we don't know all the answers, and that we need God to give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the ability to do the things that we need to do in this life. And we understand some look outward, and that's a good thing to do. I believe I wish all people would be able to look outward simply being selfish and get away from the selfish attitude and be selfless in their concern for others. I believe that's what it is, an attitude of concern, and that we want to help others in this life, and that's a good thing to do. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, He's talking to the church there. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And that last verse, he's talking about looking. Don't want to just look on your own affairs and so I'm busy with life and raising a family and, and take care of my own needs. I've got to go do this. I've got to go do that. Uh, there's more than simply us in this life and we need to be open to help others. That's really what this is all about. The Christian life is about service to others. It's not about being served, but helping others to have what they need and, and to serve them in ways that we can. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, talking about the individual benevolence that you and I can do for others. So therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all, especially to those who are of the house of the faith. While we're in this world, let's do all we can to help others. If we see needs and opportunities that you know, others may not know about, then maybe we should be the ones to take the lead and say, you know, maybe I can help this person out, and I should, and I will help this person out because it's the right thing to do. And that's what it means to look outward. And says, well, I could use this for money for myself. No, I'd rather do this and help this person and, and maybe help them have their needs in this regard. And some look backward. And this is one of the things that sometimes we do. We look back at life, especially when you get older in age, as you start thinking about in your 50s and 60s and maybe in your 70s, you start thinking about what you have done in the past and you reminisce about those kind of things. And you can laugh in the retrospect of life and say, you know, I've lived a good life. I've made some mistakes perhaps, but I've also made some good choices. I hope that we all could say that, that we made the best choice to serve Jesus and serve him all the days of our life. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we're still looking forward. And I think that's what living for Jesus does. It looks forward, not just backward, but if we think about that, though, as we sing songs many times, the song Precious Memories, you know, that song will be unscriptural completely. 
if we cannot look backward in that way as far as reminiscing and, and looking back at our life. And I think that's what many people ought to do. I think God wants us to look back at our life and how we've lived. And if there's changes that need to be made, then we make those changes while we can before eternity. But there are also some things that should be forgotten when we look backwards. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul said, Brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do, uh, those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. In other words, he forgets those things that are behind, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead. That helps us, doesn't it? When we're striving to do all we can and we are living for Jesus, then there's some mistakes we've made. There's maybe things that we used to do, like the old man that we have crucified. We cannot reminisce about that and actually be, a, uh, might say, approved of God. We should never look back spiritually. Also, we look backwards. We should never have the attitude, well, maybe I ought to go back out in the world like Demas did in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. But in Luke 17, verse 32, there's three words that Jesus said about looking back that, that makes us not want to look back. He said, remember Lot's wife. And that's important because the Jews knew exactly. They knew their history well. They understood what Jesus was saying. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. We're headed in the right direction. There's no need to go back spiritually, back to the old way of life and service to the things that we used to do when serving the devil. And some look forward. And that's what a good thing is that we all need to look forward because looking forward is actually looking to the future with great anticipation, with hope for the future, because that's all we need. As someone once said, you can live without water. You can live without food for some time. You, you, can't, you cannot live without hope. That's really the point, isn't it? The fact that we need to have hope in our lives and doing what we do, even when we get to the end of life, there's something to look forward to. You know, it's easy to have hope when you're a young person because you are hopeful about the expectation of, of things in life, driving a car for the first time, and getting married, raising children, having babies, and things like that. And doing part of that is great hope and anticipation of those things. You know, it's an exciting part of life. But what about when you get to the end of life, retirement, things like that? What do you hope for then? What is there something to look forward to? And that's really what God gives us is something that we need to have. We need something to look forward to in life. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, here what Paul would say, the next verse, we read verse 13 a moment ago. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's looking forward. Paul was coming to the end of his life. He knew that he did not have all the time that he had before. And yet we often will see that well, there's more days behind us than ahead of us. We need to have hope in the things of God more than ever in that season of life. And hope looks in Christ, looks forward. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We shall live sober, soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope. Know that, notice that. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. And that says so much, speaks volumes about the intentions of God, what he wanted for us, and how his grace was extended so that all this would take place. You and I can be saved and have this hope and have this expectation. That's what hope is. It's expectation in the things of God as we understand we need to have that, don't we? I want to conclude this lesson. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. And here is a great passage about hope. You know, Peter talks about hope so much. And at chapter 1, the beginning of this, of this chapter, chapter 1 of 1 Peter. But he also, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he continues that. And the greatest hope we have is when Jesus comes again. The Bible says about that, But the day of the Lord will come 
like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with fer in, or intense heat. I'm used to the old King James, the fervent heat. Here, Peter is telling us there's times we need to look forward to. We're looking forward to the day, aren't we? If we're living for Jesus right the way he wants us to live, we have no shame. We have no fear of that day. And so we're looking for that day. Verse 13 says, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, that's what this lesson has been all about, looking for things. And, and where do we find things we need? It says, since we are looking for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And so it's, it's our duty, our responsibility to live for Jesus the way that the book of God describes for us to live as a child of God. And we fall short, and we will fall short at times. Then we ought to get back up and continue the race that God has set before us. If you're here and you're subject to God's invitation call, if you have thought about your need of salvation, then let it be known that you need to, to put on Christ in faith. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We must repent of all of our sins, confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the very remission of our sins. There's where the blood of Christ. We do all what the Bible says in regard to salvation. Then we are free from our sins. Do you want to be free? Do you want to have the hope of heaven, the salvation that only Jesus can give you? If you need that, you want that, desire that, then let it be known and, and we can help you in any way. Reach out to us so we can help you obey the gospel before this life is over. Until next time, have a good day and God bless.